Take two. Imagine my surprise. I came back here and you're all gone. <laughs> I thought you quit. <laughs> or became enlightened. <laughs> you didn't take me with you. We'll do a little bit more. Um, we don't have much time, but we'll do a little bit. And then uh, in the evening, I'll we'll go to a, a even more interesting part of this. The question, again, we're still with Master Holmgren. If the true essence of sentient beings and Buddhas is the same, because I'm saying you have the same mind as the Buddhas, right? Then why is it the Buddhas are not subject to the laws of generation and extinction, the, um, but have incalculable pleasures and are autonomous and unhindered in their activities. So they they have this, um, let's say, a good a good existence in comparison to us. While sentient beings have fallen into the realm of birth and death and are subject to various kinds of sufferings. So how is that fair? I tell you, you all have the Buddha mind. And you go, yeah, but I don't really feel like a Buddha. I feel like I'm getting kicked around. So the answer is, all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions are enlightened to the Dharma nature and distinctly illuminate the mind. That is the source of all individual dharmas. Now, I'll break that down for you because we don't just read things and then go to the next line. It, maybe you picked up a little bit on that first read, but probably not that much, but it sounds good. So, it sounds good to me. I'll go to the next one. What did it mean? I don't know. That's the way people read. But we shouldn't do that. We should force ourselves to go back and read this again and again. I probably read this easily 20 times. If you really want to do work, this is what you do. Well, maybe five or 10 times. If you want to present it, you've got to read it 20 times. So it says all the Buddhas in all the 10 directions, mean wherever of there is Buddhas, they're enlightened, enlightened meaning they they are they have a knowing. This is the knowing aspect of the mind. It is not in the same way as we have a knowing in an idea of duality, you know, um, that that it knows it knows somebody and it looks at them and says, I know you, but it says, I know you but not talking to the person, but the mind, the heart. This is how it works. To each and every one of you, it's the same thing. So when, when it's said in this way, I know you, but you may not know me. We don't use the mind in the right way. We use it in a sense of duality instead of a sense of a community. But the community is one that has not a duality to it. So it says they're enlightened to the Dharma nature. The nature is how everything appears. Everything appears because it's created by the mind. This creation by the mind occurs from the Sanskrit word kritika samapada. Causes and conditions never fail. And in the sutras, causes and conditions never fail is not other than the Buddha mind. It is just in this way. This very aspect of mind causes and conditions never fail. 
is the Buddha mind. It's how everything works. This is the Dharma nature. But we don't see things in that way. And distinctly illuminate the mind that is the source of all individual dharmas. So it distinctly illuminates. How can that be? There's a saying in the sutras saying that 10,000 dharmas phenomena known in a single moment. We cannot do that. We have a hard enough time just holding on to one before we switch to another. But you, can you imagine a mind that can hold 10,000 dharmas and as they say, distinctly illuminate them? So they all could be illuminated at the same time. I used to think that this was baloney. I mean, I I need to see things. I need to feel things. It's not something that I just accept. But it's possible. Not possible with the illusory sentient mind that works in a linear way. But mind itself is capable of this. It is what you naturally are bestowed with. But you exchange it for this baloney that sits here. You think that this is real, but it's not. It is real to the extent that it belongs to mind, real to the extent that it is a substance of mind, but it's phenomenal. It is impermanent. It doesn't last. But that which is listening to me right now, that's mine. You already have it. This is the part that is always held back from people when, when they talk about the Dharma. They just tell people to cross their legs and meditate and hope for the best. But if people knew that this very mind is the noble mind, that the mind of the Buddhists and the patriarchs are not different than this mind right now, sometimes called the ordinary mind or mundane mind, then it helps because when you sit on that cushion, you know, every time you sit, it's yours to lose. You start with it. It's a different orientation. Instead of trying to build up to get it, you, you have it now, and you try not to lose it. It's different. So it says, distinctly illuminate the mind that is the source of the individual dharmas. How could you not know your fingers, your body? It's the source. The mind created this. So this body knows it. Remember, I, I had mentioned earlier that the mind is intimate with everything. It could be intimate with the method, but it's intimate with with. All dharma, why? It, it's like a mother. A mother that is intimate with her ch child or children. It is in this way. The same way I'm intimate with you. I'm giving you a basic cable lesson. I'm giving you a profound lesson. And I'm giving you a very intimate esoteric lesson. You just have to just kind of cruise through this, the channels and see what you want to listen to. But that's what it says, the source of all individual dharma. It's clear about it. It, it. it doesn't see things as separate from it. There's no duality. 
the emptiness that they talk about in some ways is a misnomer. It is not the emptiness of things. It is the emptiness that there is nothing that is not mine. So if there is nothing that is not mine, then everything is empty in the fact that it's included. So it's an inclusiveness. But when we talk about emptiness the other way, it makes it look like everything has to disappear. It doesn't have to disappear. It's here in accordance with causes and conditions. It will disappear on its own in due time. We try to make thoughts disappear. We don't need to do that when we're meditating. We just have to, as they say, Distinctly illuminate the mind. Distinctly illuminate it. As you were sitting there, what you don't see is there's thousands of thoughts and potential thoughts that are that are arising in mind, like effervescent bubbles. We cannot see that. We only see the ones that come to the surface and occupy center stage in our mind. We're ignorant to the fact that there's all these other ones and associated bubbles to that, that, that that's there. So if we see the shape of a donut, an associated one goes, mmm, sweet, mmm, strawberry, whatever it is, Dunkin' Donuts, whatever, all of these associated factors come in and they just huddle around the center. But that's where our method is occupies. It should be the center of attention. As the thoughts arise, they're coming up like bubbles. Let them go by. Let them go by. All you're doing, all you're doing when you're sitting there and all of these thoughts are percolating through, you're looking into mine. It's very interesting because we we are looking right into the mind. So of course we we see these things in an instant that are present, bubbling up. Let them go. They're not going to go away, even if you try to. Swoop them away with your arm and the bubbles go away. They're going to get back in line and come back up again. The more you to move them, the more they're going to come back up. We don't understand that. Once I was at a, at a retreat, and it was in the late spring at, at DDRC, which I, I don't think we, they do that anymore. They took us deep into the forest, and we're there walking. You know, it's a very warm day. And we're doing walking meditation. Very, cool. And I was aware there's, there's a lot of bugs here. But I'm just walking. So I'm not producing an appetizing heat signature for the, the bugs. And so the person in front of me gets bothered by the by the mosquitoes. So what does he do? I'm looking at him going, don't, don't, don't. And like that with his arms. So it was like a call to arms of all the mosquitoes within one square mile that come swooping down on him because they're seeing this heat signature and disturbance and they're going, it's lunchtime. And they all come down on him. And I'm going, don't move, don't move. And then he was like doing the lambada, you know, he was moving his hands this way and that way and doing this, you know. And um, I felt so sorry for him because the more he did it, the more he attracted the mosquitoes. Although there was a portion of me that still looked at him saying, better you than me, you know. But but the thing was, is, is that when we sit to meditate, don't swat at the thoughts. If you swat at them, they're going to keep coming back stronger. 
It's the same thing that happened in that forest. You just don't understand the nature of mind. If we pay attention to all of these thoughts, what happens is that they're going to come up stronger because we're giving them mind energy, mind attention. So we need to keep the mind on the method because by keeping it on the method, it neutralizes all of these things. They will still be passing by in their endless parade, but they will lose their intensity and their frequency and their power over you. When we don't do that, we succumb to all of these thoughts. We can't control what we're doing. We've lost the ability to function properly. We're a slave to all of these habitual patterns. When we do it right, the mind is illuminated. Once the mind is illuminated, it's aware of, of the method because we just put it there in front of us. All these things just go by. Why? Because we're looking into mind. This is mind. When you see there and you see all of these thoughts coming up, where, where do you think they're happening? Where do they think they're occurring? In mind. So you become aware of them. You don't have to do anything to them. You just know where they came from, from Pratika Samapa, the causes and conditions never fail. They're going to appear in your mind. It's okay, you just let them go by. Let them go by. But once we start chasing them, then we're off our cushion. Who knows where we're at? No. Where did Gilbert go? I think he's at Dunkin' Donuts. You know, he's not on his cushion anymore. No. So that's probably where you'd find him. So wherever you frequent in your thoughts, that's where you're going to be. They do not... So, so the, it's talking about the Buddhas. They do not generate false thoughts. Never fail in correct mindfulness. So they don't generate false thoughts. They don't cling to thoughts, cling to the idea of an ego, a self, or a life and being, or anything attached to it. So in their correct mindfulness, and then they extend, extinguish the illusion of personal possession. You have a question? I, I have a couple of questions. Um, the, last, the last thing, I mean, you think it keeps coming to my mind is one thought for 10,000 years. You know, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, that's the goal, right? And then, you know, but you, you have these thoughts and okay, you know, maybe I'll just let them go kind of deal and then pretty soon things are pretty calm, but. Uh, you know, so everything you're saying is like, no, but that's not the goal. The goal is one thought for different thousand years. Year. So that's one issue. Um, the second is, um, is that we'll say that, you know, you're reading a, you know, a sutra and, and, and you know, I still have a number of issues with some of them. Okay, I'm repeating it, but I really don't feel comfortable with it. So, is it okay to sit and um, and meditate, particularly if you have to be um, slowing down, falling asleep, on the you know, kind of heading in the falling asleep direction, uh, to sit there and kind of repeat a line of a sutra and let it sit there for a while and see if anything good comes up, not that it. If anything bad doesn't come up, it can't hurt. Okay. Um, as long as you don't become adept at chanting it in your sleep. But the idea of one thought for 10,000 years is the same as 10,000 dharmas appearing in one thought. That'll do you kind of a little thing to flip over and back. Because the mind is capable of that in this very moment of knowing all of these dharmas, the, the illusory mind um, that we believe to be our mind, trivial to sentient beings who are illusory, 
isn't capable of doing that. It, it doesn't have the mind power to do that. Why? Because it's a dream. In the dream world, it's limited to whatever you put into the dream. But it doesn't have the power of, of the true mind, infinite power, infinite access, infinite information. It is just a world made up of false impressions. So it's not capable of doing that. Now we're getting pretty deep with this, but it, but it kind of gives you something to play with. You know, I don't think there's anybody here that can't kind of play with this because what I'm doing is giving you something, no matter what, I could talk, you know, uh, until next year continuously here. And, and I wouldn't say anything that would be enlightening. It is your processing of it that does that. And the thing is, is that the difference is, is that if I approach this from the idea of the right view, then it, then it's worth listening to. Because at least you have an idea of where to look and where not to look. And, and so where to look is look directly into the mind. You can't miss it. You can't miss mind. If you're meditating, mind is right there. Just let it stay there. You, it's like X marks the spot. You know, you go to the mall and you go, where am I? And there's this thing saying, you are here. Okay. When you sit here to meditate, that X is right in front of you, right before your very nose is mine. You can't miss it at all. What about behind you? It's, it's there too. The sides are there. It doesn't matter. You, you begin to understand how to meditate. It's not in trying to acquire anything. This is, this is what it's often presented as, even though it says there is no, in, no attainment. But we still don't believe that. We don't believe the Heart Sutra. We can read it and say, I believe the Heart Sutra, but we don't, we don't live it. We don't practice it. But if we begin to practice the Heart Sutra, then we understand. We can see things as they really are. So it, it is in this way that we practice. If, if, if that works without interfering with, with the um, being in harmony with the true nature, then that's fine. Our problem is that we, we don't understand that our consciousness sometimes is not in harmony with the true nature. So we create things um, in our mind, whether they're out, aversions, I don't want to do this, or or desires, I want to attain supreme enlightenment. When you really practice sincerely, it changes those four great vows that we talk about to I vow to attain um, or, uh, to deliver noble sentient beings to cut off endless fixation to master limitless approaches to Dharma, to attain supreme Buddhahood, what was cut off of that, those, those vows, what was cut off was this. I vow to, uh, to deliver innumerable sentient beings of self-nature, to cut off endless vexations of self-nature, to practice limitless approaches to Dharma of self nature, to attain supreme Buddhahood of self nature, it's already all there. We don't see that. So when we make these vows, even though we may try to make them sincerely, we don't understand that it's already there. Those vows are for us to, to awaken to. Once awakened to, we go. We already got it. Now we got to just go around and just awaken everybody else of self nature because it's there. That is exactly what they're talking about here in this Dharma nature. And so, um, in any case, let me read the last part and then you got, we'll let you loose to, to eat your food of self nature. 
<laughs> so he says, because of this, they're not subject to birth and death. Since they are not subject to birth and death, they achieve ultimate state of serene extinction. Serene extinction is just blowing out this world. Okay, I'll leave that up to you to see how that gets blown out. He says, make effort. If you can maintain awareness of your true mind. So now he's talking about true mind. Remember he said fundamental mind. Now it's true mind without generating false thoughts or illusions of personal possession. So anything that you feel belongs to you, which is a duality, then you will automatically be equal to the Buddhas. You're already in. Not bad. It's finished. That's all you have to do. Now the next question, they bump it up a notch. But we'll get to that after we eat, okay? Time to eat, right? Okay. Hold your towel and I'll stand up. Okay.